Welcome to Watch the Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Post. Today we have another in our, our continuing series of looks at the path forward. Today we'll focus on the future of healthcare and we're lucky to have with us as our guest, the Chief Executive Officer of CBS Health, Larry Merlo. CBS Health touches one in three Americans in their healthcare needs in some way. Uh, and so is a, a company absolutely at, at the uh, point of, of care and delivery of services in this very difficult time. So welcome to Mr. Mr. Merlo. I'd ask you to start by giving us an update on where we are now. Uh, the numbers are familiar now to people. 220,000 Americans uh, have been killed by this pandemic. Uh, 8.2 million Americans have been infected uh, by it. And we have reports of a new surge that seems to be taking place around the country. You're on top of this looking at the data from all of your different sources, including Aetna, which is now part of CBS Health. Tell us, uh, Mr. Merlo, what the situation looks like to you, and do you think we are at the start of a new surge? Well, David, first of all, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's great to be with you today. And yeah, David, I, I, you know, we've been, what, seven, eight months, uh, you know, into the pandemic. And, you know, and I would say in the early months, we were we were working to that phrase, flatten the curve. and then we quickly migrated to fighting the virus. And, you know, and, and I would say that that's the phase that we continue to be in, you know, to be in. And, and we see, you know, peaks and valleys that uh, I would describe as being geographically concentrated across the country. And, uh, you know, and, and that's where we are today. We're, we're fighting this virus. And, you know, we, you know, we certainly hear a lot and talk a lot about, you know, where we're at with vaccine development. I'm sure we'll get into that. And, uh, you know, uh, we sit here today and, and we think about, you know, the role that uh, it's something we talk often about is, you know, our best defense right now is good social hygiene. And, and you know, as a way that we can demonstrate a responsibility to, you know, to fighting that virus. And, and David, what's interesting for us, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, Aetna, and it was in late 2018 when CBS Health and Aetna became one company. So we're really in the early stages of what I would describe as a strategic transformation to more of a diversified health services company. Uh, at the same time, the pandemic became a real opportunity for us to reprioritize elements of our strategy to uh, deliver essential health services and, and create new solutions and make them accessible in non-traditional settings. And probably the best example of that is, and, and it goes back to that question of where we're at today, and you know, testing continues to play a critical role in, you know, in, in fighting the virus, if you will. And we now have more than 4,000 uh, drive-through testing locations in communities all across the country. We've, you know, we've now tested more than 5 million individuals, uh, not just in our, uh, in our retail sites, but we've also gone into uh, underserved communities. Uh, you know, we know that you know, the virus has disproportionately affected uh, you know, the minority populations, and we've worked with community leaders to make testing more available there. So, you know, uh, you know, we're very proud of, uh, of of what our colleagues have been able to do again in in communities across the country, and and it's something that we'll continue to do uh, for the foreseeable future. Let me ask you, and I, I, I'll, I'll call you, Larry. Uh, I just want to ask 
uh, as we head into what could be a difficult winter, whether your company, your tremendous logistical uh, chain is is ready for what could be a, a surge. Do you have the PPE necessary for your for your customers for, for their demands? Your your drive through testing centers are, are extraordinary, but it sometimes takes a, a good long while to get those results. Are you able to do that faster now? And do you have plans? both to speed up the uh, delivery of results and to expand further the testing capability? Yeah, David, it's, it's a great question. And, you know, we feel very comfortable that, you know, we have adequate supplies of PPE, uh, you know, for, you know, our frontline colleagues and, you know, in, ensuring that, you know, they can perform their roles in a very safe and, and, and healthy fashion. Uh, David, we did go through uh, that surge that you alluded to earlier in that, uh, I'll say that July timeframe where, you know, the test results, you know, were delayed. We worked with uh, our laboratory partners and, you know, as we sit here today, we're seeing about 97% of, you know, the tests that we're performing coming back uh, to our customers in an average of 2.1 days. So the turnaround time has, uh, you know, has gotten substantially better. And I think the labs have done a very nice job of, you know, expanding their capacity to ensure that, you know, we don't see those extended delay periods that, uh, that we saw again in that July timeframe. Uh, at the same time, you know, we describe uh, much of the testing that we're doing today uh, you know, we describe it as swab and send, and you know, it's the uh, the molecular, uh, you know, diagnostic test. We're also utilizing more point of care testing, especially uh, on site with employers as they have begun to return uh, some of their employees back to the work site. That provides for uh, a more instant result, usually in less than you know. Uh, 2015 minutes, uh, you know, and and we expect to continue to see an expansion of uh, point of care uh, capabilities uh, as we move into the winter months. The other element, David, that I would say is is really important, and maybe this will come across as a bit of an advertisement, but you know, we're we're in that period where it's important that you know Americans get their seasonal flu shot. Uh, what's interesting for us is we have already administered more than 11 million seasonal flu vaccines, and we started that program uh, in late August. And you know, here we are, what six, seven weeks later. And you know, as we look at the year-over-year -year comparisons, you know, uh, the seasonal flu shot uh, vaccinations are up uh, about 100 percent. So it's good news in that you know people are taking that uh, public health awareness in terms of I do need to get that seasonal flu vaccine. You think about the fact that, you know, the symptoms associated with COVID, you know, are very much uh, mimic the symptoms for uh, the traditional, the seasonal flu. So, you know, getting vaccinated and providing some additional protection against that seasonal flu, I think will be critically important as we move into uh, the winter months. So the the uh, ability to get uh, your flu shot at, at a CVS or the CVS COVID testing centers are an example of how you become a direct uh, point of care, if you will, for growing number of, of Americans. I want to ask you uh, about the the future of your business, and that's healthcare broadly defined. If you were to to talk about what the new normal will be uh, in healthcare going forward hopefully after this pandemic has passed. What do you think that that will look like? What's going to be different as, as a result of what you've learned in this experience and just the recent growth of your company? Yeah, David, I, I alluded earlier to, you know, CVS Health and Aetna, you know, uh, coming together, uh, you know, and, you know, the opportunity there is is to really create a new kind of healthcare company. Uh, you know, I, I, I think all of us as individuals have, you know, experienced you know, the frustrations that exist across our healthcare delivery system. It's, you know, it's complicated to use and navigate. Um, you know, it's extremely expensive for many. And yet you think about the fact that today, you know, about two thirds of all Americans, you know, have one or more chronic diseases. We know their, their names, uh, you know, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular to, you know, to name a few. And it's those you know, chronic diseases that account anywhere from 75 to 80% of healthcare costs. Uh, 
So we do see an opportunity to make healthcare more affordable, uh, make it simpler and you know easier to use, you know, and you know in doing so help people achieve their best health. And you know, in satisfying those objectives, we believe that as a result we can reduce you know overall healthcare costs. And you know, as I as I had alluded to earlier, the pandemic has uh, it has accelerated elements of our transformation. Uh, and we're seeing our enterprise strategy come to life in very meaningful ways to meet the demands of, of communities, customers, and the clients that we serve. And, you know, David, we think about the fact that one of the keys to the future healthcare system is, is being able to meet people where they are, whether it's in their community, whether it's in their home, or now, you know, in the palm of your hand. And, you know, we talked about testing, we talked about, you know, uh, you know, vaccines. You know, you think about that experience for the consumer of healthcare, it starts with that mobile device where you can go online and, you know, you, you can schedule uh, a testing appointment. You can get all of your, you know, uh, medical information in, uh, your insurance information. And then, you know, you think about the, today in this, what many describe as an omni-channel world, which unique about healthcare is, Oftentimes, you know, in healthcare, you eventually have to, you know, see that that, that patient, that consumer face to face because, you know, oftentimes the individual needs to be touched, as is the case with, you know, the testing process. And, you know, so it, it's it's a great example of the intersection that, you know, exists with digital and, and then, you know, the role that, you know, our bricks and mortar asset plays in the community very accessible, uh, and it creates what we believe to be a more seamless experience in, you know, in making healthcare more accessible, more affordable. So, Larry, looking back at these uh, difficult months since March, as we've been struggling as a country to deal with with this pandemic, you have a, a unique vantage point outside outside politics at the point of healthcare delivery. What do you think we've done well uh, and what do you think we haven't done so well what what are your lessons learned uh eight nine months in well david I, maybe i'll speak to it on two fronts uh you know I'll, I'll speak to you know our our response as you know as a society and and maybe start there look i think we've we have great examples of the role of uh public private partnerships i think what you know what we have done you know, uh, around testing is, you know, is a great example of that. And, you know, and it, it, it speaks to that public-private partnership role at a federal level, as well as at a state and local level. And, you know, and I believe that as we move forward, we can't lose sight of, you know, the, the private sector's role in, you know, uh, in innovation, you know, and the nimbleness that exists uh, in the private sector and across corporate America, and and I and I think we have done that well. And you know, and by the way, there are many examples beyond the ones that you know I'm mentioning that CBS has been you know directly involved in across other industries, uh, you know, that have played a role in fighting the pandemic. Uh, David, I uh, the, the the second one that I'll mention is as an organization. Uh, you know, again, I couldn't be prouder of. The work of our 300,000 CBS Health colleagues, and you know, as we all have, you know, been challenged in terms of how COVID has impacted our personal lives, uh, our, our colleagues have stepped up to the challenge, you know, and the responsibilities that they have in their professional lives. And again, I think they've done a fantastic job in terms of responding to those challenges. Well, you know, while you know, continuing to you know, have the responsibility and in, 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 in managing their personal lives, their families. Uh, the, the one thing, David, that I would say I have, you know, seen in our company that I think is an important learning for us is, you know, we've got a great culture. Um, you know, our, our teams work extremely hard to, you know, always do the right things. And, you know, I think at times, you know, that has, you know, it, it perhaps takes us a little longer as we strive for perfection. What I've seen is uh, you know, is a response where you know people have figured out, hey, here's a solution, and I know I can make it better, but you know we need to get this in the market today, and you know it is going to satisfy the need that you know 
people, you know, people are counting on us for, and we'll make it better along the way. So the speed for innovation uh, is something that, you know, I've been very pleased with. Uh, just, David, when you, please. So I just, I just wanted to ask, uh, Larry, your employees, in a sense, are frontline workers uh, dealing with the public. Folks coming in with with healthcare problems, they're not sure what. Have you, have you been paying your employees, your frontline employees, bonuses during this difficult period? Uh, just tell us how you, how you're trying to keep up that that uh, uh, frontline spirit among your workforce. Yeah, David, we've done a number of things. We've we've given uh, you know bonuses to our, our frontline workers. Uh, we've also provided resources. Uh, you know, we have many. Uh, you know, uh, working families, if you will, and you know, we provided resources around uh, you know dependent care, uh, you know, child care to you know uh, certainly you know help them uh, you know in that period of time where shelter and place orders were you know in effect largely across the country. Uh, you know, we've done some things with, uh, especially with our part-time workers, uh, with additional benefits, so that you know, obviously, like many. Uh, we were talking about the fact that, you know, if you have any symptoms, please stay home. Okay. And, you know, we didn't want to put our employees in a position where, you know, they had to choose between, you know, doing what was right from a health point of view for themselves and, you know, and their community uh, and, you know, and, you know, having that challenge between, well, you know, it's also about a paycheck. So, you know, we worked hard to take that, uh, you know, off the table. So, you know, we've done a number of things to, you know, to support, uh, you know, our our colleagues in that regard. In addition to, you know, all the things that we've done within the store environment, whether you know, uh, ensuring a, a safe and and healthy environment from PPE to, you know, uh, plexiglass barriers that have been installed in a number of areas of our stores, uh, you know, to you know, to ensure the right environment. Let's talk about a question that's uh, on, I think, all of our viewers' minds, and that's the development of a vaccine, uh, what, what progress is being made, how it's going to be delivered. You're in a position to have pretty good information that I hope you'll share with us. Let's start with a question of, of where vaccine development is. I, I think there was a meeting this past week of a key uh, committee that reviews uh, vaccines in development. Uh, what have you heard from that group and what do you hear generally about how far off a vaccine that can be delivered is? Well, David, we we have been uh, you know, working with, uh, with HHS uh, more as it relates to the distribution and the administration of uh, of a vaccine once it's available. So, you know, in terms of where the development process of the vaccine is at, at this point, you know, uh, you know I, I hear the same things that, you know, that uh, that you report, uh, you know, in the media and, and in the news that, you know, there is progress being made. You, you know, we've seen you know, companies like Pfizer, Moderna, you know, move into their phase three clinical trials and, you know, uh, you know, and there continues to be, you know, an awful lot of optimism that, you know, we, uh, you know, we may be begin to see a vaccine in market, uh, you know, early next year and, you know, and, and some believe later this year. Um, you, you probably saw the announcement last Friday, we were pleased to be you know, again, back to the public-private partnership. Um, you know, work with uh, you know at at a federal level in terms of you know being able to provide uh, the vaccine to you know long-term care facilities uh, you know across the country once it's available. You know, we have about 2.1 you know seniors that are in uh, nursing homes uh, in assisted living facilities, and you know, uh, obviously. Uh, you know, uh, many of those individuals, uh, you know, represent uh, among our most vulnerable populations. So, you know, getting the vaccine, uh, you know, uh, into their arms is going to be a real priority uh, once it's available. And, you know, again, we've been working with, you know, with HHS in terms of, you know, the plans that, you know, we can provide in terms of supporting that, uh, you know, that need. And, Quite frankly, David, it goes back to what we were talking about uh, earlier. We have, you know, more than thirty thousand 
you know, healthcare professionals, uh, when you think about pharmacists, nurse practitioner, physicians assistants that, you know, are in communities all across the country. So, um, you know, and, you know, the pharmacist and, you know, nurse practitioners can play a critical role that, you know, they go well beyond, you know, what you would think of, you know, when you think about the role of the pharmacist associated with, you know, your your medication and, you know, uh, dispensing your prescriptions. And, you know, and, and we're very proud to, you know, see pharmacists be able to practice to what we describe as the top of their license. Let me ask you about a, a particular uh, issue that's that's come up, certainly in the political discussions, and that is whether people are going to fully trust a vaccine when it's introduced. What can CBS Health do to encourage a, a trust uh, among among your customers that the vaccines that will be offered are, are safe? Well, David, it, it is a concern and, and it should be a concern for all of us as we think about, you know, again, fighting this vaccine and or fighting this virus and the role that the vaccine plays in doing that. And, you know, we've seen the surveys, we've participated in some of the surveys that, you know, uh, today only about 60% of Americans, you know, said that they will get the vaccine. And, and David, look, I, there's no question that, you know, pharmacists are among the most trusted, you know, professionals across all industries. And, and you think about the accessibility, you know, of the pharmacist and, you know, and what comes with that is the trust that individuals have, uh, you know, with their pharmacist. I'm a pharmacist by education. Uh, I started, you know, uh, my uh, post-college career working in a community pharmacy, actually in, in the Washington DC area. And, you know, I can speak to that firsthand. Uh, you know, I, I knew my customers, uh, knew their families and, you know, and the discussions that we would have, it, it you know, oftentimes, you know, people, you know, they're more comfortable, you know, asking you the questions. There's a lot of follow up from, you know, perhaps a physician visit. And, you know, you play that trusted resource in terms of, you know, what do I do about this? How do I access this? And, you know, and I do believe that pharmacists will play an important role in in educating individuals about the importance of that vaccine. And, and David, I, I, I you know, I think back to you think of all the challenges that you know we've had to deal with as a society. The one challenge that we haven't had is accessibility to you know prescription medications, and that is something that you know we put a real focus on you know at the onset that we must ensure the continuity of the, the pharmaceutical supply chain. Again, that's not something that anyone has talked about because it hasn't been a problem. And just think about what would have happened if. You know, we had a shortage of maintenance medications for diabetes, for hypertension, for cardiovascular disease. We would have really compounded, you know, the the societal and the health problems created by COVID with now, you know, a compounded problem where people that were being maintained, you know, uh, and their chronic conditions were, you know, well in check, you know, because of a lack of medication you know, that becoming out of whack and, and it would have further stressed, you know, the healthcare system and it never happened. And, you know, so, you know, again, you know, credit to everyone associated with that pharmaceutical supply chain. And, and look, I, I expect that we will play a critical role in, you know, educating, you know, all individuals about the importance of the vaccine and, you know, and the say along with the safety and effic efficacy that comes with that. Well, that's that's useful to to know. So our our viewers should understand. I, if, if I'm hearing you right, Larry, that you go into your CVS, you got questions about a vaccine at the blessed moment when that vaccine is available, and the, your pharmacist will be able to help you think about making good choices. Uh, let, let me just ask you one additional question about about vaccines. President Trump last night during the debate talked about the role of the military. Uh, in uh, getting the vaccine available, if I understood him, distributing it uh, to, to, I assume, to folks like you who will then put it in the hands of, of, of consumers. Could you give us a little better sense of, of what this rollout is going to be like based on your conversations with HHS and other officials in the government? I, I didn't understand the military part of that. Yeah, well, yeah, David, you think about uh, the role of the military. Uh, 
you know, among their many areas of expertise, uh, you think about the logistics challenges that the military has in terms of, you know, making sure that, you know, the variety of you know, I'll use the word products that they deal with are in the right places at the right time. And, uh, you know, so that becomes critically important when you think about, you know, the distribution, you know, uh, role of the vaccine from manufacture to, you know, the points of access where, you know, that vaccine will be administered. So, uh, and, and David, what we're learning from the vaccines in development is that there are special handling requirements uh, you know, for that vaccine from a, a storage point of view, uh, you know, and different vaccines have different refrigeration requirements. And, you know, that's something that, you know, that we have available today in all of our pharmacies, uh, you know, recognizing that there are products that are, you know, safely stored at room temperature. Some require, you know, uh, refrigeration, some require you know, uh, you know, freezing temperatures. So, you know, that that's where uh, the military has been playing, uh, you know, an important role around, you know, the distribution that will be associated with uh, with the vaccine. So let me ask about the simplest uh, aspect of, of health healthcare uh, COVID prevention, and that's wearing a mask. You, in a speech this week, I think, likened uh, the acceptance of wearing masks to acceptance of wearing seatbelts, that once upon a time wearing seatbelts were seen as a terrible infringement on your freedom, and we don't even think about it any anymore. Curious, uh, Larry, what CVS tells its employees they should do if somebody walks into a crowded CVS not wearing a mask. How do you tell your employees to deal with that problem? Yeah, David, it's been... Uh... You know that that has been, uh, as you know, a subject of uh, of great discussion. And and look, I, I I mentioned this earlier that you know good social hygiene is our best defense uh, as we you know keep our fingers crossed on that vaccine becoming available soon. And my mask protects you. Your mask protects me. You know and you know uh, you know I I really do believe in that you know analog that. You know, it, it took years, if not decades, for everyone to get into the habit of, you know, seatbelts do save lives. You know, and the responsibility that that we have as individuals to not just protect ourselves, to, but to protect each other. And, you know, and you know, we were, you know, looking to demonstrate good social hygiene, starting with a mask, and and trying to establish that behavior and that discipline in a matter of days or weeks. You know, and we don't have years with which to, you know, build that, uh, you know, and or change that behavior. And and David, I w- I will say, you know, back in the March April time frame, uh, you know, it was uh, more of a challenge, you know, in our stores, and you know, uh, we were doing a lot around, you know, communication. I think that, that became one of our guiding principles in terms of how do we keep our 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 employees up to speed on, you know, everything going on, what we know, what we don't know, and, and, you know, provide frequent and transparent information. And, you know, and we talked a lot about that. Uh, And, you know, uh, we wanted to avoid confrontation at the store level, but, you know, we wanted to ensure, you know, the safety of, you know, of our employees, as well as the other customers in the store. I, I will say that we have come a long way as a society in that. And, you know, and, you know, CVS as well as many other, um, you know, retail locations have, you know, whether it's through posting signs, uh, you know, communicating broadly in terms of, you know, uh, you know, asking, uh, you know, customers to, you know, uh, wear facial uh, masks and, and the importance of that. And, you know, as we sit here today, I, I, I would say that as a society, we have come a long way. Uh, in terms of establishing, you know, uh, uh, more of a discipline than I'll say where we were back in the spring time frame. So we have uh, just over a, a minute left, and I want to make sure before we close, I ask you about the other issue that we've been thinking deeply about as a country uh, this year, in addition to the pandemic, and that's and that's racial justice. CVS is a is a massive nas- national presence. Uh, you're all over the country. 
Just tell us briefly what you're trying to do to improve the way in which CVS serves minority populations in America, what you're doing that's new in responding to this unusual moment for, for America. Yeah, David, great question. And, and, and we, like many others, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know uh, the killing of George Floyd uh, stopped us in our tracks. Uh, and, you know, we took probably, I'm going to say 30 days to go back and evaluate, you know, all of the various programs and activities that, you know, we had across our, con our, our, our company, you know, uh, for our colleagues. Uh, for our communities, as well as uh, the suppliers that we do business with. And the objective of, of that period of time was, let's go back, let's evaluate what's working, uh, you know, and, and let's evaluate what may not be working as well as we, you know, think it should. You know, and a third important question, what, we, what may be missing, you know, from, you know, from our plan? And, and David, that resulted in, the good news is there were, there were things that were working you know, extremely well, and you know, in an opportunity to do even more, uh, there were things that you know weren't working quite as as well as we had hoped, and you know, and things that we that we saw that were missing from our plan. So, you know, uh, we I'll, I'll say we rewrote our plan, if you will. Um, you know, and you know, we have a commitment, a five-year commitment, uh, you know, associated with about six hundred million dollars of investments. Uh, you know, in our employees, uh, you know, to ensure that, you know, uh, we have, you know, uh, more representation uh, across, you know, all levels of our company. Uh, you know, one of the things that we found was working extremely well is, you know, several years ago, we began a supplier diversity program. I, I remember when we started, we had purchased about $200 million from uh, diverse uh, owned suppliers. Today, that number is over $2.2 billion. Uh, so we established new goals to continue to keep that going. And, and then we, we also stopped and looked at, at things that we were doing in communities. We talk a lot about the social determinants of health as an example and the fact that your zip code in some communities you know, can you know, directly you know, tie to your health status more so than your genetic code. And you know, what more could we do there, you know, whether it was around you know, workforce programs as well as you know, ensuring, uh, you know, access, you know, to health and, and things that directly impact health like housing. So, uh, look, I think we have a great plan, uh, you know, as we go forward. It's, uh, it's something that, you know, we'll be able to measure uh, and evaluate ourselves, ensuring that, you know, we achieve the goals that, uh, that we've established for ourselves and our company. So, Larry Merlo, I want to thank you for, for joining us, giving us this uh, unusual tour of, of the landscape in, in healthcare. We're all grateful to your company and the employees who are out there every day uh, dealing, dealing with us, uh, helping get us the medicines that will keep us well. So thanks for joining us. We'll be back at Washington Post Live next week with a whole slate of new guests. We hope you'll join us. But today we want to especially thank Larry Merlo, the chief executive of, of, uh, of CVS Health.